Okay, everybody, we're going to get started. If you're here for the Comics and Hollywood panel, you are in the right place. But first, my name is Buddy Scalera. Uh, you can find us on all of our social media platforms at Comic Book School. Be sure to hashtag. Now, one thing to keep in mind, your uh, cosplayers are very photographable. We are not. But the way the con decides what programming to put on next year is they look at what's trending on their social channels. So if you want more educational planning of this nature, be sure to tweet it and to let the con know that you appreciate this sort of stuff. I'll also be found in I8 a little bit about me. Um, well, actually, this is our panel. You're in the right place. Uh, I run Comic Book School. I've published six educational books, most of them photo reference. I've published a handful of comic books. And our community of Comic Book School just released just on Friday. Our second anthology, our first one, won three awards, and we are looking for contributors for our next anthology. Our editors are right over there, raise your hands, editors, and they will be taking uh, business cards and giving you information. And this is one last bit of housekeeping. Uh, this is the weekly comic book newsletter that I send out about, I guess, once a month. Uh, gives you information about job listings. In fact, we just listed a job for AWA last week. So if you want to break into comics, this may be your way. And some of you will get free markers. Uh, if you ask a question, we have a sponsor called Marvin Cheetah, who's here on the floor. And if somehow you catch me walking around the con and take a photo, we'll give you a prize. You'll almost never find me in my booth. But enough about me in the comic book school. This is the Comics and Hollywood panel, where we're going to level expectations and give you a sense of what you need to know as a creator. But first, let me introduce my guests. So Axel Alonso is the Chief Creative Officer of AWA. He was a senior editor at DC Comics, and he was also editor-in-chief at Marvel Comics. He has an amazing storied career and broke in in one of the strangest ways as a music journalist, but he has left his mark on the industry. Please welcome Axel Alonso. Lee Kramer is the president of TV and Film and the co-founder of Aftershock Comics. He also comes to comics from a storied background in Hollywood where he was a development ex executive and has worked on some of the biggest names in Hollywood at Endeavor. And Lee now is leading Aftershock Comics to publish some of the best comics in the business that are also being optioned left and right. Please welcome Lee Kramer. And I'm going to take my notes and literally put them down because my next guest I introduced from memory because when I was at Wizard, he was my boss. So if I don't know who this person is, shame on me. But he came to comics through banking where he was a vice president of a bank. And when he came to Wizard, which was in complete shambles, he shipped us all into shape, organized Wizard, and actually helped launch what became the golden age of Wizard with conventions and all the other specials that you know and love. After that, he went back to Valiant Comics, actually he went from Banking to Valiant to Wizard, and then back to Valiant where he's leading the team to uh, launch the next renaissance of Valiant titles, including of course the recent Bloodshot movie. He knows more about movies and comics than anybody else I know. It's Fred Pierce. Cheering. Sometimes we do this in Chicago or LA, and you guys do not want to be quieter in Chicago and LA, do you? No. Alright. So we're gonna start this way. We want to talk about managing expectations, and Lee, I'm gonna start with you. There are many creators. Who, who here is an independent creator who's made your own comic? Who's planning to make their own comic? Alright, so there's a good number of people who want to make their own comics. Lee, manage expectation. What is the West Coast Hollywood view of the comic book business? I think we might have to share that one microphone. Can you just slide that? Yeah. Sorry, I don't talk okay. that much in public. I'm going to take off my mask for it. But, you know, expectations in Hollywood, honestly, you know, sadly, I think the Hollywood community really hasn't treated comic creators in the best light. You know, what I would say as an independent creator is you want to go with a publisher that, um, it's gonna help you develop the story, but also keep you as a partner. So you really wanna make sure 
that you understand your contract, like, you know, I say this all the time to creators, you get what you're signing, and you feel comfortable, then you should have some sort of representation. Look, we love a quick contract to be signed, but honestly, you should always have a lawyer of some sort. I would recommend an entertainment lawyer, even doing your comic contract, because it's really about the ancillary rights, as even though Aftershock, everything for us is story first. I don't care about film and TV. The comic has to be great. The story has to be great. It's very cliche what I'm saying. But if the comic doesn't work, the other things aren't gonna happen for you. And you have to be very clear to your partners who say the publishers. The first thing I ask is, do you have hopes and dreams to write in film and TV? So be upfront with your, with your publisher what you wanna do. We cannot promise anything. As a, I'm not an owner of a studio. Nobody can promise you that unless you're a studio buyer, a network, a streamer, or a studio. A studio is the only person who can promise you anything. I can try, we can all try, to get you attached as a producer of some sort and, you know, go there. But it's all just about being honest with your creator and, you know, just telling great stories. But now that's awesome. So since the microphone is closer to you, Axel, what's your view of the expectations that creators have about Hollywood? You've spent your whole career in comics, but can you just talk about expectations to lead us off? I agree with everything you just said, first and foremost. Um, it's worth noting that um, a lot of Hollywood, Hollywood comes to Lego Comics because it's produced a lot of IP in the past couple of decades. And it's a lot easier for someone to read a comic book than to sit down and read a novel. The story's already storyboarded and all the rest, so we've gotten a lot of attention, but a lot can go wrong along the way. Starting with the relationship with your publisher, as Lee said, you want to make sure that you know what you're signing. You want to make sure that you have an editorial team that will maximize the potential of your story. You want to create a good comic book. I'm a comic book editor, I'm not a Hollywood producer. My job with my team down there is to make good comic books, but I think a good comic book is a good story, which means it could be anything. A movie, a TV show, a cartoon. And no one who does a comic book says, oh my god, I pray it stops here. <laughs> Please, please, please don't adapt my comic book. I guarantee Robert Kirkman and Mark Miller didn't say that. You know, probably so. But I think it's very important that you understand also that um, you'll hear a lot of things from Hollywood <coughs> where they just want to smoke up your ass, and it's very easy to be seduced by it. Seem so to keep a level head about how things work, because even when you've got a good publisher behind you, a good producer, a lot can go wrong. So you need to make sure that the people that are that are chaperoning your your story to the next media level, know what they're doing, know how to, know how to work, surf those waves, because they're crazy. That's a really great answer, right? <laughs> so, Fred, you, know, you were one of probably the first people that actually helped me to understand how intellectual property was made and then was optioned when we let off Black Bull when we were working at Wizard. But most notably, and congratulations, you recently had one of your properties make it to the big screen, Round of applause for Bloods, that's actually a good movie. Can you, can you just talk a little bit about the kinds of expectations creators might want to start out with in this industry? Well, I think the first thing that you need to be concerned about is getting people to notice your, what you're writing. So your first expectation is how do you get people to care? Everyone in this room who's created a comic has created the best comic that ever was. Just ask you and you'll tell us. <laughs> so that's not a question. But there are 400 comic titles printed every month. How are you going to make yourself stand out? So your expectation, your first expectation needs to be how do I get noticed? Now when Buddy and I started out doing you know, Black Bull comics and all sorts of other comics, really there were a number of different ways to do it. Uh, when Buddy and I were at Wizard, we would send two, 3,000 copies of Wizard to Hollywood for free every month, and Hollywood would look through Wizard um, and go, this is good, that's good, that's good. There is no longer a Wizard, and Wizard, they're not being a Wizard, hurts the industry in a lot of ways, but you have so many other avenues to make yourself noticed. So you can be noticed, you know, through, um, you know, webtoons, you can be noticed through online, you can be noticed, I mean, the best way, as far as I'm concerned, is still to be noticed in the comic book stores and to be promoted through the ink on paper industry. But 
You know, if you make sure that you have a huge social media presence, because when Hollywood is picking up whatever you're doing, they want to know how it'll be easier for them to sell. Okay? So I think that's the, that's the thing. What's your expectation? Do you want to get a movie? Do you want to get your IP option? Well, if you get it option, they'll give you some money. Okay? It's nice to get money. The option money is less now than it used to be, but it's still nice to get it. And then you can go around and say, oh my God, I had a movie option or I had a TV show option. The beauty of, for Hollywood of optioning your thing is generally your IP. It's generally for 18 to 24 months. You can't talk to anybody else about optioning it. And then, um, and then they're not obligated to do anything. So... That's the key with an option. So, you know, I'm, and I'm not going to go on because I can, I, I was, I used to teach, so I can speak 15 minutes about anything. <laughs> All right, guys, so uh, real quick, I just want to mention some. Oh, okay. Yeah, just one yeah, take point. Take. And it is not uncommon for something to be optioned when the group optioning it has absolutely no, no intention of making it. Or they might be doing it to cock block a rival from, 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 from doing it instead of that. So a lot can go on. Again, there's a lot of hazards along the way. Just because it's optioned, doesn't mean it's going to get made. It means that it's in play to get made. It's good news, don't get me wrong. It's good news. You get some cash, among other things. But again, it's not a guarantee of being made. Yeah, I, I agree with everything Axel said and Fred's saying. Now, you know, just, not the afterthought, but don't <laughs> <laughs> No, but just so, you know, because there's a ton of creators out here, just so you know, 99% of film and TV never gets made. And I'm very cynical on front of LA, Hollywood. Until I'm on set and shooting, money can be in the bank. It's not real until you're shooting. But you know what Axel's saying is is incredibly true. Same with Fred. Like you just have to really, really you know believe in your story and create the best book possible. And creating the best content will get you where you are, where you want to be. It's not about the film, TV. That will happen naturally. And then the other thing you've got to remember, and I'll let these guys speak more, is that. Once your book is published, it's there forever. It's on the bookshelf forever. You should be proud. But when there's an adaptation, if you're involved with it or not directly, it's, it better be changed a little bit. You know, going from medium to medium, it's not going to be an exact adaptation. And if you're trying to do an exact adaptation, honestly, it rarely works. It just doesn't work out typically. So just remember that. Create something that's there forever. You know, one of the things that we've talked about in previous panels, and you saw this at the social media panel with Lisa Wu and Ruth Ann Thompson, is that you do need to build your platform and utilize social media. All of the publishers are very much aware if you already have a baked in following. That was something that we talked about. Can you talk a little bit, starting Axel, with what you look for as a publisher? Are you starting by saying, can this be a movie or a TV show? Or are you looking at it solidly as a property, and are you looking at their base? Well, I use the same standard I did when I was at Vertigo and then later Marvel, which is, is this going to be a really cool story? Can I imagine an audience? I edited Preacher. We used to joke at the time, this would be a really great cable TV show. <laughs> it came out around the time of, um, of uh, The Sopranos and the whole emergence of cable TV, R-rated TV. We thought this would be an amazing spaghetti western TV show. And there you have it. Ditto with the boys. You, know, you just look at this and you say, this is a really great story. And a really good story you should be able to translate to any medium would change it, some adjustments. So, so yeah, I mean, I think the key thing for me at AWA is me and my team read stories, we, 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 we give our honest gut reaction. How do I feel about this story? Does it have me on the screen? Is it intriguing? You know, and of course part of that is would it make a cool movie, would it make a cool TV show, but it's really, is it, would it make a cool comic book? Because I don't keep my job based on being a good movie. I keep my job based on being a good comic book, well-regarded comic book, and a real comic book. Because comic fans, they smell shit, and they also know when, they know when you're trying to pull an over. You know, um, Fred, you have a slightly different experience, obviously, than Lee and Axel, right? You have, you have a, a universe of existing characters. Can you talk a little bit about how you think about creators coming into your universe to create for your characters, and then also what you're thinking long game about what might happen with your characters on the screen? Well... Since we have a universe that we're building into... You may put the mic a little closer. Yeah. Since we have a universe that we're building into, the key is, does the creator know our universe? Does the creator know the tenor of our property? 
and dealing with uh, if you're if you're if you're a talent and you want to do your own books, okay, um, but you want to make your name known, dealing with a company like Valiant helps a lot because we promote our creators. So a lot of the people that you see, a lot of the talent that you see that our big names have gotten their own properties done, started with Axel at Marvel, or started in, or started in DC, or started at Vertigo, started with us, okay? Um, it's rare that you know, we're working with talent that has, been, has done their own book first and then come to us on some level, but not really. You know, we've worked with the Jeff Lemires, we've worked with the Robert Venditti's, and you know, I loved Robert Venditti's movie Surrogates uh, before he worked for us. And you know, and he was and he was able to um, to get that done. So the key is, you know, when you're doing this, is just work. Make sure you're always working. Make sure you're always writing. Make sure you're always being promoted. Make sure you're always promoting yourself. For us, we're working with our comic books first. It's almost first and only, okay? Um, you know, I'm the publisher. The word publisher means different things in different worlds. Our editors and our marketing staff and our sales staff is much more involved with how the story goes than I am. You know, on some level I'm an editor, but you know, because I'm looking at the books and I'm looking at what I like and I'm looking at the storyline and is it consistent. The other advantage I have is I've been you know, I was at Valiant in the day when Valiant was hugely successful um, in the 90s, and now I'm with Valiant when it's hugely successful in its reincarnation. So I scan both worlds, okay? The original concept of Valiant, the original concept of those characters, and I'm often dealing with, you know, what's the core concept of the character? Because there's no comic from 1992 that you're reading that hasn't changed. <laughs> So what's, what is a good change? And there are certain movies I've seen where they've done 27 different adaptations of the movie. And there are Godzilla the movies that really work well, and there are Godzilla movies that don't work well because they weren't true to the original premise of Godzilla. So you have to be true to your, your core. And the beauty of the comic book industry um, is that you, in the comic book industry, you create your product. If you're a writer, you as the writer. If you're a writer artist, it's even more control. Not always necessarily good, because sometimes the, the community is better than the individual in terms of that. And, and sometimes it's the artist. So make sure that's the best piece of work it can be. And the thing I don't like that I see in this industry a lot is a creator will create something and then stay with that and stay with that and stay with that and stay with that, you know? And I'll often be at a convention and I'll see the same product in front of the creator five years later that I saw now. Do a lot of different things. So, Lee, one of the things that I think I noticed, and I think it's for all of your uh, comic lines, but something I noticed with one of your comics, and correct me if I, if I don't have this right, or I think it was Frank Thierry wrote Pestilence based on an idea from someone else, I don't know who it was, but you, you've brought in quite a few screenwriters uh, into the comic book industry as well. Can you address that for us? Yeah, <laughs> so we're always looking for the best ideas, you know, what Fred and Axel are talking, be it in a universe or creator own like Axel and I do. To be honest, there's only so many of you, and there's writers from different mediums, like with Pestilence, what Buddy brought up, that was my buddy, who came up with a video game idea they never pitched. And I thought, oh, Frank would dig this. And so they became partners and he wrote it. It's a good concept, it's a good concept, yeah. You want to tell the concept? So the, the concept is this, you know, That's everybody cool. knows what the Black Plague was. Well, it, it really wasn't. It was like a zombie uprising and the Knights of Templar and had to go and quell it. So what we think is the Black Plague is really the devil you know, possessing people and so forth. It's a lot of fun, and you know, that was the mediocre pitch, but it was <laughs> something that a, that a buddy of mine pitched me in a bar. This is the other thing, you know, you gotta listen to everybody, it doesn't matter. Most of our creators, just, you know, so you know, we work with Garth Ennis, you know, be it Paul Jenkins, Frank Thierry, well-known creators, you know, Jimmy and Amanda,
Amanda, can you call me Ani, and Amanda, and then um, our biggest books are from unknown writers. You know, when we worked with Donnie Cates on Baby Teeth, he had done two books at Dark Horse and people didn't know him well, and we were talking, and I remember one time, Mike Martz and I, and Mike's in the audience supported me. He's my partner, editor-in-chief. Um, but he was pitching his books, and I go, Donnie, if you were Garth, I'd buy every one of these books. I need to read something. And so he sent us the one page for Baby Teeth in the first three issues of God Country, and we were lucky enough to see it. And I was like, Mike and I immediately were like, this is one of the best things we've read. You never know where it's gonna come from. So, you know, people break in all the time. Marguerite Bennett, who did Animosity for us, and she's done other books, was a mountain. Well known, Animosity's been a gigantic book for us. And then, um, Zach Thompson, Lonnie Nadler, that's another big, Undone by Blood, Norman Reedus is gonna co-star in it, and they're producing with us. Unknown writers, essentially. You know, it's been shocking, you know, just, the new creators are the voice of the media, and I think Axel's seeing that too as well. Like, it's just an amazing time to come in, and we need more stories, and we need stories that DC, Marvel, and Valiant are doing great superhero stories. Well, we're open to that, but we're open to any story, except for too many time travel. It's very hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, Axel, uh, I think it, it bears out a question. What is a great pitch, and what do you look for? when you're thinking about a great pitch. And also, remember the concept here is also what creators want to know about Hollywood. So feel free to take it in any direction you want. I put a lot of stock in what is called the elevator pitch. Imagine I'm walking from my desk to the elevator. Get my attention in that one minute or 45 seconds it takes to get there. What you say had better be good, it had better grip me, or I'll, I'll stop listening. If by the end you got my attention, I knew you're somewhere. Now that doesn't mean an elevator pitch sums up everything about a property. There's nuances that will come in the actual writing and the actual elaboration on, on the pitch, but I put a lot of stock in that. Because when I think about it, some of my favorite movies and books, the elevator pitch is, is what, get, what got me in the first place. So very much at AWA we think about what is the high concept driving the book? How, what does the story mean today? I put a lot of stock, and I did it more than to go as well, in telling stories about what we're dealing with right now, the zeitgeist of the day. What's going on right now? How do you not tell stories about creeping fascism today? How could you possibly ignore that? How could you decide, ah, oh, I'm not into it. I'm seeing this one out as a creator. In an age of Me Too and pandemics, how could you not have an opinion on these subjects? So I look for stories that, that zero in on what, what we care about now. You know, Stanley and Jack Kirby, the heroes were created by nuclear bombs and uh, radiation and stuff was a concern of the 1960s. Prior to the pandemic, I talked to J. Michael Straczynski about creating a superhero universe. And we said, let's have them born under a tragedy. But without missing a beat, he said, it should be a pandemic. He said, no one gives a damn about radiation or nuclear war. What they care about now is a super flu. So he wrote the Resistance comic book a year before COVID hit. Mm. The first issue was in stores the week of the shutdown. Because he's mindful of the world, and I think that's very important. That's pretty amazing. And by the way, can we just give a little bit of enthusiasm and, and love for these guys? This is great information. <laughs> Because I came to the industry from banking. <laughs> no. So, pull the microphone closer to you. Um, you know, Fred came from banking, and one of the things that he really stressed us at Wizard was this is a business, right? This is a business of passion, but it is a business, and we had to treat ourselves and conduct ourselves in a way that was appropriate to, at the time, the Wizard brand. Can you just talk a little bit about having a business mindset when you're getting into comic books, and also considering when you might be approached by somebody from Hollywood to talk business? Um, I think you have to be professional. You have to come closer. You know, it's, it's, it's fun to be sitting around with your friends and kicking ideas back and forth. But, you know, as Axel said and as Lee said, you have, you're going to have one minute to sell yourself, if that long. 
Okay? Just think of how quickly you shut off things and if somebody wasn't your friend. So dress appropriately. Now appropriately doesn't mean in a business suit and tie anymore. It means dressing appropriately is always in Valium gear. We have bloodshot gear, we have Valium gear, we have all the X of gear, whatever you want. If you're wearing Valium gear, you'll be able to sell your movie. Okay? <laughs> or your TV show. Um, but be professional. What is it that you're looking to do? You know, how are you approaching? And do I look like somebody that I want to do business with? You know, if you're talking to a comic book company, you're asking us basically to invest probably somewhere between sixty and a hundred thousand dollars in your idea. Okay? And that's if we don't go, you know, really hot and heavy long term. Why are we gonna do it? Why is the elevator pitch gonna catch me? Um, before I ever heard the term elevator pitch, when I was writing, um, I, was, I was probably 17, 18 years old, and a, uh, my friend's uncle, who was, a, who was a writer at the time, earning his living writing, said to me, what's the title? He said, if you don't know the title, you don't have a story. Because I showed him an excellent, he said, look, it's an excellent story, but without a title, I wouldn't have read it. So that's really, you know, what is it that you want to do? What is it that you're trying to accomplish? The first step, if you're talking to someone like me or my editors or Lee or Axel, is make sure that you think this is the best thing since sliced bread. And if it's not, if you know it's not the best thing since sliced bread, take an acting class, okay? It's very important. You're not going to sell anyone if you're not sold. So that's the first thing. And test drive it on people that will tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Yeah. Right. Some of you have mothers and fathers who will always tell you it's great, don't ask them. Someone who have, some of you have brothers and sisters who always tell you it sucks, speak to them. But ask them why it sucks. That's really what you want to know. You want it to be better the next time you look at it than the last time you look yeah. at it. And it sucks. And you're in the best industry in the world. There is no better industry. You can walk up to anyone in this con who's, been, who's done what you want to do and ask them how they did it. There is no one path. Lee has a path, I have a path, Axel has a path. I've seen guys come into the industry uh, for the last 30 years. I have been in the industry for, at least 30 years. <laughs> for the last 30 years. And you know what they all did, all the ones who were successful? They asked and they asked and they asked. They asked me, they asked everyone. And the other thing they did was listen. If somebody looks at your work, and if you're an artist, I can look at somebody's work in two minutes and tell them what I like and don't like. And you want to know something? The next year at the convention, when I gave them constructive criticism, nine times out of ten they come back and thank you. Um, writing is a little harder, okay? But but artwork is much easier. But that's really my that's really my big advice: present yourself well, ask a lot of questions. If you see, you know, somebody who's accomplished what you're looking for, how did you get there? And I don't care if it's Jim Lee, I don't care if it's Axel, I don't care if it's me, I don't care if it's Lee. You know, the only other industry like ours where you can walk over to famous people or people who've made it in the industry is the NASCAR. Is NASCAR. Nobody else. Try to walk over to a Hollywood executive or try to walk over to, a, to, a, to an act, a famous actor. Their, their security guards will make sure you're done. You're in the best industry in the world. Take advantage. Round of applause for that. Now, Lee, you kind of spit a ball for you. It's a lot. You are a Hollywood executive. What's your view? Ooh. <laughs> yeah, what these guys have said is 100% correct. What I just wanted to add to what they're saying is, guys, they're gonna, people are going to pass on their projects all the time. You keep coming back. We all have egos, feelings of hurt, because it's important to you what you're writing. And sometimes it may not be the right time, but it could be the right time for another publisher, another buyer. So don't feel bad if one project gets passed. I'll tell one story. The writer we've done the most books with, Colin Bunn, who probably most of you know, he, we, yeah, <laughs> we, uh, he pitched us like 20 things. We weren't into it. 
pitched us 15, we bought three things in the room. You know, we've now done over eight books with him, and obviously Colin's worked with every publisher, have been fantastic. People, even the best, they get past them. You just gotta keep coming back, do not be worried. It just may not be for the right, it may not be for the publisher you went to, and it may not be the right time. But, you know, what uh, Fred and Axel were saying, really believe in it, and also with a pitch, and please, please don't have a misspelling in the first sentence. That <laughs> makes us worry. And yeah, make sure your pitch looks professional, and ask the publisher how they want you to present it, unless you start working with them and you get a short hand. But yeah, just make sure it's presentable and everybody will take it seriously from the get-go. You know, one of the things that we've talked a lot about at comic book school is the ability to build a network, but also be able to pitch verbally. A lot of you will say, oh, I'm an introvert, I can't talk to people. But as you've heard, you know, that relationship is very important. Axel, can you just unpack a little bit the importance of the network and then how people can present themselves verbally to you? Because sometimes there's not always a good time. Sometimes you don't have time walking toward the elevator, and I'm sure you've gotten pitched every minute of the day, maybe outside the bathroom stall. I'll be honest with you. Stalk Axel. already have I'm the guy getting pushed away from the Hollywood actor, by the way. I'm that guy. You know? but, uh, I think that the key thing about, about um, the, the question again was... Um, was how people can conduct themselves okay. in purpose. I put a lot of stock in, in, in the written pitch, to tell you the truth. A written pitch to me, that's a, a really great little nut graph, one, two or three paragraph pitch gets my attention. Mm -hmm. I appreciate the economy, because it's a very small investment on my part. And of course, I could stop reading at any point, right? Not into this. But if I keep going, it's a really good indicator. At that point then, I reach out and say, let's talk more, you know? When I start up AWA, I saw a little book called Sync, self-published, I believe, by John Lees and, 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 and Alison Cormack, and I loved it. So I reached out to, to John, said, throw some stuff at me. He threw a lot of stuff at the wall. As I told him, I said, throw enough shit at the wall, some, something sticks. And he did, and he had this one idea called Hotel I Loved. We dug into it, and me and my crew came back with notes. John took the notes very well, because his story was wonderful. There was a baby in there. It's a bit of bath water we wanted out. He took the note very well. That's a good thing. Don't be defensive of your work. If, a, if someone gives you a note, listen to it. Process it. It doesn't mean it's right, but don't dismiss it and don't get defensive. I appreciate working with writers that know that input is going to come. Input is, is a necessary part of the process. So I, I think a written pitch is valuable to me. I put less stock in some of the people to really pitch me, even though I talk about the elevator pitch. For what, what I really mean is get my attention in a few sentences. Yeah, I think that getting feedback is a really important point. And, and Fred, could you just talk a little bit about that? I, the first time I'd ever had a property come out, uh, it was actually with Mike Martz, and we had immediately heard from entertainment Hollywood people. We didn't really know what they were, but the first thing they wanted to do was change everything. So like, they basically just wanted the title, I guess. Um, can you just talk about what it is to work with Hollywood and the types of notes that they give feedback on your books that you've already produced? Because there's inevitably going to be a change from the page to the screen. Well, we're, you know, we're lucky, um, and it's not luck, it's also, you know, D Dan Mintz, you know, has, um, who's, who owns the company, has been excellent, and, and he's very good at hus husbanding the process. And we work with good producers. Um, we work with, you know, we're working with, we work with Sony to create Bloodshot. Um, we work with Neil Moritz and, and Toby Jaffe. And they were very, very aware of how important being true to the character was. So they would always ask us, is this version of the script true to the character? And Dan, you know, I don't know would, would weigh in and we would weigh in. Not all. Public, not all producers and not all studios are that careful, but um, you know we're working with our Harbinger movie with Paramount, and they were also very aware. But a lot of that comes from your partnership, um, and you would love to be in that situation, guys. That's the situation you want to get into. So the key to getting into that situation is. Make, it is actually getting it done so you don't spell anything wrong, okay? And yeah. that two-paragraph pitch, which is very important, 
And when I read a comic, just so you understand, if I'm not interested in the first three or four pages, I say to the editors, why are you showing this to me? I need to catch the attention, but that's with everything. And if you want to be a brilliant um, comic book talent in either writer or artist, you're going to have to sell yourself. That's part of it. And if you can sell yourself, partner with somebody who can sell you. Okay? So the beauty of being a bigger company like we are is there are people who are great at selling. There are people who are great at editing. There are people who are great at identifying talent. There are people who are working in Hollywood out of, out of Beverly Hills. You're not going to have that. We have that. Okay? Because DMG does that for us. But you're not going to. But you want to get there. You want to, you want to speak. You're here. Okay? I would imagine you're here because you haven't made it yet and you want to. Okay? So to me, make sure that the legal work is done properly. You're doing IP, you're doing an intellectual property with your friend, and it's all great. Who owns it? Who, who owns the trademark? Who owns the copyright? If you don't have that straight, no business person is going to speak to you. And if you read about some of these, and when you're not successful, you're all friends. The second, oh you're, <laughs> the second you're successful, and you read about this all the time because we all love gossip, the second it's usually successful, these friends aren't friends anymore. So make sure that the owners of that trademark and the owners of that copyright are solid. Make sure it's a real legal document because no one's going to speak to you. Lee's not going to speak to you in Hollywood and Al Axel's not going to speak to you if you can't prove that you own and you have a chain of title for that. Okay? So even, even here, sitting in this room, Make sure that what you're doing is copyrighted, and if you have a logo that you like, trademark it. It's not all that expensive, it's not all that difficult. Copywriting is easy, okay? Uh, trademarking is a little bit more difficult. But even do that now, and that'll give you an idea of who you're talking to, who you're presenting to. Because what I also want you to do, all right, because we're a very laissez-faire industry for the most part, okay? But even the guys who are laid back, you know, the Jimmy Pamiatis and the Amanda Connors and the Joe Casadas, all these are very laid back guys. They're wonderful guys, but they were always professional. You know? And you have to do that. Who owns what? I remember, you know, Jimmy and Amanda once presented something to me in the early days. I think it might have even been Black Bull. Um, and we couldn't do it. I knew it was a great story, but we couldn't do it. It's like, it's something Disney couldn't have done. If it, those of you who know their work, I'm sure you can remember <laughs> what it was. And also, if you're a writer, understand, your artist is your co-creator. Your artist is your co-creator. At AWA, we follow what is the industry standard for, for creator-owned comics, which is writer and artist own the IP 50% each, and they both relinquish an equal share to contribute to the colorist, who is a collaborator as well. Colors usually comes in lower than that. That was a drop to my comment. Yeah, that's how much we agree. I'm drunk, That's how much we agree. So the thing is, understand that you're gonna you're gonna need to treat your artist as a co-creator, not as, as just someone that draws your book. And that's not the way it works. They do a lot of work, they put in even more work than you do behind the desk drawing the book. And the colorist brings an added value as well. So knowing that to so all of our writers, you know, Garth Dennis. And, Mark, and, 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 and Gore Saduka both co-own the IP for Marjorie Finnegan, 50-50. They both contributed so the colors can have a cut. You know, one of the things, Lee, that I, I think, because most of us here have spent the majority of our career, 25, 30 years plus, in comics and came to Hollywood through that way, you came in from a different way. Can you just talk about the perception that you as a Hollywood person might have had prior to becoming a comic book publisher. Yeah, as being a comic fan my whole life, I, I literally learned to read by reading Spider-Man because apparently I didn't want to read at like four or five, so my godfather was an owner of three shops, brought me to it. But I always knew basically comic book creators haven't been very happy with Hollywood in general. They signed agreements, they didn't realize what they were signing, you know, that's why all of us at the beginning, you should have somebody represent you, you should understand what you're signing and you should like those partners. 
But the perception, and honestly, and I, I've found this a lot, and it's, a, it's frustrating to me, is that comic book people are dumb regarding Hollywood. And Hollywood tries to take advantage. So you just have to be with the right partner and you know, knowing what they do. So like one thing we do at Aftershock, and I know these guys do this as well, is we stand up for the creators, they're our partners, they're our lifeblood. You know, it's one thing if you have a universe, it's another thing you do a creator own. You know, we have over, we published like 103 books, 103 series, they're all their own universes and so forth. Every project is its own, you know, is it, every project we have a different partner and you just have to make sure you're standing up for them and standing up for yourself and not being taken advantage of. And that's, you know, what uh, Fred was saying in terms of having an axle, having the right partners, the right producing partners. You know, just be upfront from the get-go. This is what we expect. When you're talking to Hollywood, tell them at the beginning what you expect. And guess what? If they pass, it's because they did not expect you to ask that, nor, you know, do they want to pay you properly and so forth. But there are plenty of people in Hollywood who will because the concept or the story is so great, they can't live without it. And that's where your leverage is. So always believe in your story, and if you have a great idea, it all it's cliche, I've said it already once, just go back to your story, you'll find the right partners, but please, please ask the questions at the beginning when you make any deal, be it with a publisher, and then later when the publisher on your behalf is making the film or TV, ask anything you think is stupid, because you don't know everything. It's a new, it's a new rodeo every time, honestly. And as someone said earlier at the meeting, you leave, your book is on the shelf forever. I yeah. mean, Why the Last Man? Was there ever a better time for Why the Last Man to come out than now? I mean, Jesus Christ. It's fucking the best time. Thank God it wasn't made 10 years ago. What better time than right now for Why the Last Man? There is none. So, Fred, you had also mentioned something, and I think it's important. Uh, it was something that we learned early on. Uh, many uh, people have greater room properties. First thing you're supposed to consult is a lawyer. Um, most of us don't want to do that. Most of us want to bootstrap it. Uh, can you just address uh, the reasons why you need some representation? And Lee, I think you might want to touch on the same thing and the same, same with you, Axel. Just getting somebody else in the room who's got your back. Well, there's a, a couple of reasons why you would want to have a lawyer or an agent, okay? Um, one of that, one of those reasons is they're going to amplify, they, they have connections you don't have. So if you have an agent or a lawyer, they're going to open doors for you more easily than you'll open the doors for yourself. And the second you have representation, a lawyer or, you know, or an agent or a manager or anything like that, then now you're going to be professional and if they're good at what they're doing, they'll make sure you're professional. And you don't know what being professional is, okay? I don't know what being professional is, and I've, you know, and I've been in very professional, you know, how do I dress when I go to Sony to, uh, to discuss how we're gonna market the bloodshot together? That was a question I really had. Do I wear a suit and tie? It would be silly in the Hollywood, you know, thing. So, yeah, I asked, all right? So, because to be overdressed is just as unprofessional as being, uh, you know, as doing that. So that's really what it is. They're going, they're going to know from their perspective the right thing to ask. And you have to, and remember when you're sitting with a lawyer with an agent, you're really not on the same page there either. They have, what, you know, they have their perspective, you have your perspective. Always remember they work for you. Also. And very importantly, they will understand the fucking contract. <laughs> Contracts are the most boring documents on earth. Why do I know? Because I fall asleep halfway through every one I read. As someone put input into our contracts, they are complicated and boring. Now I'm no dummy until I read a contract at which one I'm a real imbecile. So you want a lawyer to be there to understand every line of that contract, to understand what they're looking at. And as past there, there are all the nuances that, that Fred is talking about. Watching your back and representing you. Watching your back. Lee, you anything to add to that? No, these guys did a great job. There's not much more to add to that. I'm, I'm sorry, I leave a whole next <laughs> Okay, so, oh, do you want to clap a little? <laughs> now, Roman, one of the key tenets of what we're about to talk about are uh, the fact that these are publishers. They want you to buy their books. 
So the way you say thank you is you go to their booth or to wherever their books are sold and you buy their books. This is how we keep this ecosystem vibrant and alive. You're part of it. So that's how we say thank you. Remember, we're going to be uh, reminding New York Comic Con that we enjoyed this panel. I'm going to be asking our guests uh, two questions. One is where they can be found and what they're working on and what we should look for. And then uh, a provocative question of one piece of advice that they wish they'd received when they were early in their career. So I'm going to start with you, Axel. Uh, where can they find you and what new properties should they be looking for? Uh, well, uh, I'm on Twitter and only Twitter. I've never done Facebook. I never have. I never will. Um, and I have an Instagram account just to follow my son, who's a teenager, so I want to make sure he's in too much trouble. So that's me right there, Axel Lanzo Marv. Uh, so you can find me there. And uh, I'm the Chief Creative Officer for AWA Upshot Studios, putting out books like Marjorie Finnegan, Temporal Criminal, um, The Resistance, Bad Mother, all creator owned with creators like J. Michael Straczynski, Garth Ennis, Peter Milligan, Mike Diodato, Frank Cho. And what should they be looking for? Like, what's, what's a shiny example of something they should be running out today and buying? Fight Girls by Frank Cho is an amazing action-adventure science fiction. Imagine if you took The Hunger Games and The Bachelor and pushed some stuff together. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's, it's a science fiction romp. Ten incredibly fit, strong women have to compete in a, in a winner-takes-all competition to become queen of the galaxy. They're dropped in an alien planet where they have to do four different challenges. Everyone else dies, the winner gets the crown. The stakes couldn't be higher. That sounds like a fun show. Yeah. And what is one piece of advice that you wish you had received early in your career? Um, in comics, one of the things that I learned very quickly was Recognize good advice and bad advice. I got a lot of bad advice. It was usually people saying, you can't do it that way. I always asked, why? People would say, I remember back in the day when people would say, no one wants to use Black Panther. I said, well, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I loved the character. I still do. I saw Black Panther movie 20 years before it happened. You know? In a world of hip-hop, how is this not a major fucking movie? Now look at it. So I think it's about looking at hearing advice that's too insular in, in, the, in the industry is counterproductive. Trust your instincts about all things. What movies are you watching? What books are you reading? What are you seeing on the news? These are all indicators of where the culture is going. Back in 2000, I imagined a black Captain America. I thought to myself, I don't buy the origin story. I don't believe that Uncle Sam would have tried out the serum on white boys. Have you heard of the Tuskegee experiment with syphilis? There's no way they would have sunk it into a blonde haired white boy boy. And we did a book called Truth. It was incendiary. People got pissed off. They said I'm ruining their childhood. I didn't give a shit because I knew I was right. <laughs> Kyle Baker and Robert Morales wrote the book. It did very well. It was controversial, but it did well. And recently, on the Falcon and Winter Soldier, Isaiah Bradley, the first Captain America, showed up in the, in the, in the epilogue. I almost cried. Couldn't believe it. 21 years later, he's on, on the TV screen. And everyone said, what are you doing? So, so taking good advice is, is uh, your... Recognize good advice and try your best to recognize good advice and bad advice. I got plenty of bad advice in comic books throughout the years from people that were not imaginative enough and who only wanted to appeal to the market as it exists now. I imagine an audience of, that included women two, 20 years ago, and it does now. So. Axel Alonzo, everybody. I am proud to say that I have taken excellent advice from Fred, who's been my personal mentor over the years. But Fred, I'm going to ask you to drop some truth today. I'm blushing. You are blushing. You want to grab that microphone. So uh, where can they find you? What project? Should they be running out and buying? And then what's that one piece of advice you wish you had received early in your career? I find that Facebook, Twitter, Instagram are black holes that you'll <laughs> fall into and will not get your work done. So I would be stay very far away from as much of that as possible because everyone who's a creator, what you're mainly doing, if you, if you think about it, is what do I do? I'm not writing a book today. I'm not drawing a book today. So that's mainly what you're doing. So stay away entirely. I do. I have, you know, 
my, my wife or my staff will say, Fred, you have to see this. It came up, you have to look at it. And then I'll look at it. Um, you can find me at Fred P at valiantentertainment.com. Put in the subject line that you saw me at uh, Buddy's, um, at, at Buddy's <laughs> panel, or whatever that is, and I'll look at it because we all get a lot of emails that are just, you know, Chinese, Chinese printers trying to have me do the work there. So, I, you know, I get a lot of that too, uh, because, you know, even though I'm the publisher, I do print, you know, I, I, I handle the print and that. Um, the, in, the advice I should have followed, which would have led for a very unhappy life, but a much more successful life, is don't go into the comic book industry. <laughs> Stay in the banking industry, it pays much better. <laughs> my wife wished I would have taken that advice today. My kids probably do too, but the truth of the matter is I love the industry. That's why I came into the industry and stayed in the industry. It's a phenomenal industry. Uh, the advice you should follow is persistence. Um, I know a lot of um, people have been very successful in this industry. I knew some kids who were friends um, in middle school of my son. And one guy, his name is Jack Antonoff. I don't know if you know him. He's a Grammy winner. He's done Bleach. He's done Fun. Um, I remember once I was reading an interview of his and somebody asked him, how does it feel to be an overnight success? And he said, I've been performing for 12 years, it doesn't feel overnight to me, okay? That's who you want to be, okay? It's very nice if the first thing you create is recognized immediately, but sometimes, you know, it doesn't happen that way. Just to make sure that you're, there's a lot of white noise out there against you. No one has to do your book. Why do you want them to have to do your book? And that's what you should do. The best book Valiant is doing is always the next book. You know, everyone asks me, what's your favorite book? My favorite book is the next book. Our next book right now is Harbinger Number 1. It's a phenomenal book. It's available at all comic book stores, it's available on Comixology, it's available on other, other digital platforms. Um, and I'll tell you the, the final thing about the industry that I love. Our industry is a social network. Our industry is, is mainly held together by comic book stores, going into comic book stores on a Wednesday or on a Saturday. Speaking to people, a lot of us in the industry are, we, we can function in the regular world, in the civilian world really well, okay? But we really feel most comfortable at these cons. We really feel most comfortable um, when we walk into a comic book store or bump or how many times have you made eye contact with somebody on the street because they were wearing, you know, a piece of, you know, a piece of licensed product. Even if you didn't like it so much, all of a sudden, you know, you get, look, if I see an Eagles fan walking around someplace, I'll say hello even though I'm a Giants fan. So, we good? I'm good. All right, Fred Pierce, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Lee, where can they find you? What's the one book that they need to run out and get today? And then what's your one piece of advice you wish you had gotten? It's easy. I have a universe. With, yeah. <laughs> Anyone he mentioned gets him into trouble with everyone else. Exactly right. No, uh, you can find us here at the con at booth 2337. Please come by. There's a lot of books that people know about or don't know about. The new book out is Chicken Devil. And I'm going to Brian Bucciolato, a.k.a. Booch. Go pick it up. It's about a vigilante hot wing restaurant. So let's go have fun. You'll love the book. It's brand new from us. Brian signed the other day. There's signed books available and a lot of great covers. Uh, the one piece of advice would just be be honest to yourself, but also to be honest with everybody you talk to. And in Hollywood, you got to schmooze. Half my job is schmoozing. But I like people who are direct and who are honest. And then you also have long-lasting relationships. Because the one thing about Hollywood is you work with people you like. So when you know somebody's not being an asshole trying to rip you off, you'll keep working with them. But first and foremost, you'll like working with people who are creative and visionaries. 
but be honest and direct. And so go get Chicken Devil, go to booth 2337, support all the publishers and support the stores. That's what's really important. As these guys have said so eloquently, this medium is really special and it's great to be published. We love digital, but we love actually publishing physical copies. So please support your local retailers, your local, your local stores, and uh, support every publisher. We need as many out there as possible. So thank you all. Lee Kramer, everybody. So one really loud round of applause for our guests right now and all the time they've spent with us. Sharing the audience. You guys are great. I hope you enjoyed the programming. My name is Buddy Flair. This is Comic Book School. We love you and really appreciate you. We're going to be doing some photos, so thank you so much. And please, a round of applause for all the AV people and people working so hard in the background. Thanks, everybody.